Sí, sí, sí. Our first reading today was taken from the 19th chapter of Leviticus. It's known as the third book of Moses. And it remains the third book of both the Christian Old Testament and the Jewish Torah. Initially, chapter 19, well, the whole book of Leviticus has got all kinds of interesting things in it, but initially it provides the details of the sacrificial worship that was to be used in the tabernacle, which was the, the portable sanctuary built by the Israelites as they followed Moses through the wilderness. But then it provides instructions that were given by God to Moses for how we are to live our lives reconciled to both God and each other, especially in times of disagreement or conflict with our neighbours. For instance, God tells us that at such times we should not profit by shedding the blood of our neighbours, but should judge our neighbours with justice. The passage then explains that justice involves reproving our neighbours, which is an interesting word, but it means to gently correct them when we feel aggrieved, but not to take vengeance or bear a grudge against them. Otherwise, in the eyes of God, we begin to incur guilt ourselves. Instead, we're told, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. Indeed, a later verse in the same chapter makes it very relevant to the Israelites because verse 33 reads as follows, when an alien resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the alien. The alien who resides with you shall be to you as a citizen amongst you. You shall love the alien as yourself, for you also were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. So keeping that in mind, later in our reading from the gospel, according to Matthew, which records events shortly after Jesus had ridden humbly on a donkey into Jerusalem and welcomed by large crowds, we hear the Pharisees approaching Jesus in an attempt to test and to try and discredit him. You see, their own power, their leadership, their authority for the interpretation of Torah, the Jewish holy book, was threatened by him. And so, thinking that he would rise to the bait, surely, an attempt to interpret and rank the Ten Commandments given to Moses by God, one of them, a lawyer, asked, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Now, if he'd attempted to rank the Ten Commandments, it would have given the Pharisees justification for condemning Jesus for blasphemy. Instead, Jesus responded with words from the Shema. It's a Jewish prayer found in chapter 6 of Deuteronomy, which is the fifth book of Moses, the fifth book in Torah and the Old Testament. And this prayer was given by Moses, by God, for the people to pray in order that the Ten Commandments might be forever impressed upon their hearts and minds in all that they say and all that they do. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, Jesus responded. But then he continued with a quote from Leviticus that we just heard earlier, when he said, and a second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. To many of us, it might seem such a very straightforward, simple, compelling message. But if we all learn to love God and one another as ourselves, 
then the world would be a much gentler, kinder, better place for us all to live in. And of course, it's not just a teaching that is found in the Christian or the Jewish holy books. I quote from chapter 3, verse 3, of the Quran, the Muslim holy book, where we read, it is God who sent down the Quran to the prophet Muhammad with truth to confirm what came before it, the Quran and the Gospels. Of course, many people, particularly leaders such as the Pharisees, don't want to hear about having to love their neighbours. Neighbours who they believe to be inferior than themselves. Indeed, as the leaders of the day, the Pharisees were content to treat Samaritans, Gentiles, in fact, just about anyone else who they considered to be different as unclean heathens. Certainly not neighbours who they ought to love and treat as equals. I think it's important for us to understand what God really means when we're told, told to love God and to love our neighbours as ourselves. It doesn't mean that we're being commanded to simply feel an emotion in our hearts or to simply say that we love God and our neighbour. Now, words and feelings are all well and good. But when Jesus tells us that we are to express our love, he is compelling us to be courageous and to take affirmative action. Action which leads to change. Action that actually demonstrates to others particularly to our leaders, that we truly and unconditionally want to love God and our neighbours as ourselves. It's far from what we're seeing in the news these days. It comes from this golden rule that is common to literally every faith that exists in the world whether it be Baha'i, Sikh, Hindu, Christian, Jew, or Muslim. There's a whole range of them there. The commandment is that we are to do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. I think most Canadians pride themselves on living in a country where people do try to live according to the golden rule. Canada has gained an international image of being a peaceful welcoming place in which to live. It's a country that has attracted people from all over the world, people like me, who chose to immigrate and settle in a country that, that was infused with love and peace and opportunities, to leave old divisions, prejudices and discriminations far behind and to move to a place where those things don't exist, to build a better life for ourselves and our children. The words of our national anthem say it all as we sing, God keep our land glorious and free, O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. It's a land where freedom of speech is protected, but the language of hate is illegal. It's a land where our constitution is designed to promote racial tolerance and defend religious rights and freedoms. It's a land of equal opportunity where people are accepted for who they are and discrimination of any kind is not tolerated. And it's a land that's proud of the image that it projects to the rest of the world. No wonder we sometimes find ourselves looking outwards and expressing our anger and frustration at the intolerance, violence and injustice we see over there in so many other countries. For instance, we could look towards Myanmar, where the Rohingya religious minority are constantly being persecuted by the military leadership, to Ukraine, where we see Russia seizing land and killing innocent civilians, or to Israel, where we have recently witnessed shocking atrocities being committed by both sides. In all these cases, it is the extremist leadership that is responsible for inflicting such pain and suffering upon the innocent civilians. I find it ironic that on this coming Thursday, 
I was scheduled to leave Canada to lead another tour of the Holy Land, which has now been delayed until next November. I'm deeply saddened by what has happened over there because I have many friends in Israel and Palestine. And I know that the majority of Palestinian Christians, one of whom gave me this cross to wear, Palestinian Muslims and Israeli Jews, they simply want to live and raise their families alongside each other in peace and in harmony. You may be interested in learning that in addition to visiting many biblical sites when I go over there, I also take people to meetings and spend time with both Jews and Palestinians. We want to see how they live. We want to discuss their efforts that they have underway to recognize and show that they want to love their neighbors. Sure, there are tensions that have arisen out of the failure of their leaders to address long-standing issues such as security and self-determination and land ownership. But through the healing efforts of many grassroots organizations, and I name just a few such as Standing Together, Community Peacemaker Teams, Jerusalem Peace Builders, Hand in Hand, Kids for Peace, and many others that have brought all sides together to come to know each other and to respect and love one another. Progress was in the process of being made. I just pray that those achievements will not now fall by the wayside and can still serve as the building blocks for a better future for all. And yet, as we like to bask in that self-image of our own Canadian peace and harmony to the world, I wonder how many of us have thought to ask or are aware of people in our own neighborhoods, perhaps even some of our own parishioners, who have been deeply affected by recent events. Affected because it serves to remind them of the past discrimination and prejudice that they may have suffered in their own lives, in their own countries, or perhaps even here. Here in Canada, the land where we pray that God will keep us glorious and free. Yet a place where discrimination based on religion, racial origin, and sexual orientation still exists. I'm reminded of an earlier passage in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, where during the Sermon on the Mount of Beatitudes, Jesus says, how can you say to your neighbor, let me take that speck out of your eye while you still have a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you'll begin to see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. For instance... Let's consider the centuries-old systemic racism that still exists against our First Nations people. Colonialism is probably something we, want, we don't want to keep being reminded about. But unless we do keep being reminded about how offensive colonialism is to God and to our indigenous peoples, how will we ever put an end to it? For instance, I think by now we're all familiar with the government residential schools that first opened with the assistance of various church leaders, including our own in the 1870s, and it continued to the 1990s. There was also the relocation of First Nations people from their traditional villages and hunting areas to remote northern reservations where many of them died of cold, disease, and starvation. Even today, many live in awful conditions with permanent boiled water advisories. And not long ago, the Canadian government was forced to settle a huge class action lawsuit involving 35,000 Indigenous children who were scooped up from their homes, from their families in the 1950s and 60s to be placed in white foster homes, then put up for adoption in an effort to assimilate them into white society. 
And finally, there was the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, which concluded that the tragic violence that they experienced here in Canada amounted to genocide. Think about that. Genocide here in Canada. Wherever to truly become a model society that demonstrates love for our neighbours, we need to start taking ownership for the racism against our First Nations people that was instilled into us for generations by previous racist leaders. For instance, does anyone remember 37-year-old Joyce Echequan? She was a First Nations mother of seven children. And she was admitted to hospital in Joliet, Quebec, just a couple of years ago. She was crying out in agony and for help because she had severe stomach pains. But instead of receiving loving care, some of the nurses decided to verbally abuse her, telling her that if she was stupid, there was nothing wrong with her and she'd be better off dead anyway. So as she lay there, dying in a hospital bed, she decided to film the abuse that she was receiving on her cell phone. And that later served as evidence that led to the creation of a provincial task force on racism in Quebec. Is it really any wonder that some First Nations people have called for the words of our, of our national anthem to be changed to O Canada, our home that exists on native land? Now, the fact that many of you are probably outraged by these stories is a good reflection of our faith, both in God and in what this country, what this country means to us. But these stories should also serve to remind us that we cannot just say, oh yes, we love our neighbours and they think we've done enough. If we are to accept the challenge of being the voice, the hands and the feet of Jesus in the world, then we need to accept his challenge and demonstrate that we do love our neighbour as ourselves. We must be prepared to personally challenge all forms of racism, discrimination, violence, regardless of race, religion or sexual orientation, wherever it is happening, whether it's in Myanmar, Ukraine, Israel, Canada or anywhere else. That means that when we see, hear, or hear about the actions or the words of others who are treating their neighbours as less than themselves, we need to respond by loudly condemning those actions to those leaders responsible, either locally, nationally, internationally. But those who are in a position to influence government policy and bring this violence and discrimination to an end. I still remember sitting down in this church a year or so ago and writing letters on behalf of Amnesty International to the world leaders demanding that they release political prisoners. Actions like that matter. And if we just stand by in silence without reproving or gently correcting those leaders, then we are condoning their behavior and we become complicit in enabling them to continue sowing the seeds of hatred and discrimination. It's almost like we're being called right now to a battle for Jesus, a battle to defeat the evil of hatred, prejudice and discrimination against those who are seen as different. It just seems to go on and on. And it holds some groups throughout the world captive to ongoing abuse and marginalization. The manner in which we demonstrate our love for God and our neighbors through our faith, inclusivity and outreach will help shape the values of our own society and enable our country to truly be the model that we want to portray to others throughout the world. And it all begins by us remaining faithful to God and the teachings of Jesus Christ. It's God's plan God's plan to first see that all those created in God's own image 
standing side by side, worshipping, praising and loving him. And then God wants us to support each other through challenging and difficult times, demonstrating our love for our neighbours through our actions, obeying God's commandments and growing ever stronger in our willingness to stand firm in resisting the evil of racism, prejudice and discrimination against those who some regard as different and inferior. It's up to us. It's up to us to remain faithful, to follow Jesus, and to start making Canada and the world a better place for all through our example.